Okay, so this is a classical problem dealing with energy and I have a block here and this block here is on an inclined plane and I'm going to say that this is a frictionless plane here, so this is frictionless. And this block is going to slide down the plane and it's going to drop a certain height and this, this plane here has friction on it but this object is now going to roll down the plane and the classical question is this, which is going to have the larger speed at the bottom? In other words, if I take a block and just let it go and let it slide, how is that speed going to compare to a wheel that has friction that can roll down this inclined plane and when it reaches the bottom, how will that speed of this wheel compare to that block, basically? And so this is a cool, cool question to look at because it makes us uh, address the concept of energy and also understand uh, translational and uh, rotational energy uh, intuitively here. So here's our, our problem here. We have our friction, like I said, we have our frictionless plane here sliding and then friction here. So when we look at this problem, the first thing we need to do is we need to understand that uh, if I have two different points here, let's say that I have uh, point A here at the top and then let's say point B at the bottom, and now here I have point A at the top and I have point B at the bottom, okay, I'm going to be able to say, well, the energy at point A is going to equal the energy at point B, right, because I have conservation of energy. So that, that much is, is given, right? So let's take a look at the green one over here. I'll draw it in green so you can take a look at it. So the energy of A equals the energy of B, okay? So I'm going to use conservation of energy to find the speed at the bottom. Well, when I'm at the top, I'll just write the whole thing out just so you can see it, but I have U initial plus K initial equals U final plus K final. So when it's at the top, it's at rest, I'm releasing it, okay, so there's no kinetic energy at the top, it's all potential, and when I'm at the bottom, I'm going to have all kinetic energy. So I'm going to say, well, my speed, my, sorry, my, my potential energy, MGH, is going to equal the kinetic. Now this kinetic only has a linear uh, or translational speed, so it's just going to equal one-half mv squared, so the masses are going to cancel out here, you can see. So the V at the bottom is going to be the square root of 2GH, like that. Okay, so there it is at the bottom. So let's take a look at what does this one do at the bottom. Well, we can take the same concept here. I can say, well, my energy is conserved. I can say my energy of A is going to equal the energy of B. So at the top, I can say U initial plus K initial equals U final plus K final. Okay, This one's a little bit different though uh, on the second half of the equation. At the beginning it's the same. I have all potential energy at the top, right? But at the bottom I have all kinetic energy. So at first glance this looks like the same concept as up here, right? Okay, but this one's a little different because now I have two types of kinetic energy. I have one that is linear and I have one that is rotational. So that energy is now has, that kinetic energy has to be shared by the linear and the rotational. Okay, so that's going to change our outcome a little bit. So if I say uh, MGH equals one half mv squared, that's the linear, and the rotation is plus one half i omega squared. Okay, now that kinetic energy has to share between the two. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, if I went ahead and I solved for V, I'd have to subtract everything over, so I would basically have um, 1 half mv squared equals mgh minus 1 half i omega squared, and then I can, you know, multiply through by 2 and take the square root, divide out one of the masses, so I can basically say uh, V squared equals mgh minus one half i omega squared uh, over two over m times two, right? And then I can just take the square root of that. So what was the point of deriving all that? Well, to show you that in the case of this, it's just a square root of two gh. In the case of this, okay, you're basically taking that term and you're taking you're taking energy away from it. Okay, so let me just 
give it to you another way here uh, to show you how the speed would actually be less at the bottom. So the linear speed is going to be less at the bottom for the rotating one than it would be at the top. Okay, so let me just give you an example uh, conceptually here. Just one last example here just to show you. So let's say that the energy at the top was uh, 10 joules, right? So that means that the potential energy at the top is 10 joules, right? So because it was all potential, so potential at the top was 10 joules. And at the bottom, this kinetic energy, linear, okay, uh, was all of the con was all of the energy at that point. So at that point, that became 10 joules, right? So 10 joules of stored energy became 10 joules of kinetic. Fine. There's your motion. But now, if I start at the top here, let's say I started again with 10 joules. Let's say that everything was the same in terms of the mass, the height. But now, when I get to the bottom, my total kinetic energy, okay, the total is going to be 10. So now maybe part of that energy is linear and part of that is rotational. Okay, so maybe part of that is 5 joules linear or 5 joules rotational. It's just an example. But now I have to split up that energy. Part of that energy is being used to rotate it. Part of that energy is being used to make it go forward. So now you can see that that linear energy would be less. So the speed is going to be less at the bottom for this one than it would be for a block that just slides on its own. And that might seem counterintuitive because we think of wheels as spinning fast, right? But it takes energy to spin it and it takes energy to get it going down.